After a great deal of soul searching, Dean left the security of corporate America and decided to pursue other dreams. His first traveling adventure began in 2001 and spanned almost two years covering 28 countries. Dean's goal is to share his stories with the hope of changing his audience's perspective about people and cultures in the world while helping them remember their own dreams. These days, when Dean's not traveling, he's busy as a contributing newspaper columnist, photojournalist, children's book author, and keynote presenter across the country. Please join me in welcoming Dean Jacobs. She's awesome. Yes, she is. <laughs> She's awesome. <laughs> yeah, what a, what a gift. Um, thank you. Uh, th what a privilege it is for me to be the inaugural speaker for this incredible group. I feel like I found one of my tribes, <laughs> which is a pretty cool thing, especially when we live in the Midwest where things get a little bit parched sometimes in the creative world. Is that true? So, yeah. I just want to, oh, cool, we didn't lose anybody. Good. <laughs> Oh, you know, good, John. I need you there, buddy. I just want to acknowledge you and recognize you for coming out this morning to be a part of this creative conversation, for putting a stake in the ground in Omaha, Nebraska, and the region for what's possible. So let's give that one more big round of applause. Because <laughs> that is not an accident. Those things happen with intention, with purpose and commitment. And, and well done, Kim. Well done. Thank you. So uh, I was asked to talk about fantasy. That was the topic. It's, well, I learned later that's what everybody's trying to talk about right now. And <laughs> I think fantasy is probably given a bad rap because it has a negative connotation to it. But I think there's probably been some of us who've used a little bit of fantasy to get through this last election cycle. Would you agree? Yeah. Right. And probably for the next four years for some of us too. Yeah. Isn't that right? But Fantasy actually also plays a very important role in the creative process. Fantasy is like defined, I was looking up in the dictionary, you know, something that's um, yeah, improbable or remotely possible. But if we start looking in our creative process, if we start looking into the world what's possible, we have already limited ourselves before we even get out of the gates. Isn't that right? Because if we're looking at the rest of the world for what's possible, we've already limited what's possible in our creative process. And then on top of it, when you start looking around the world and what we, how we gather information about the world, is most of that's done through the what? Through the news. And what makes the news? The bad stuff, right? And that gets cycled over and over and over again. And I feel like that robs the oxygen out of our creation and our curiosity to be engaged in the world. And pretty soon, we start building barriers to keep all the bad things out. But what does that also keep out? All the what? The good stuff, too. And pretty soon, that compresses us into a small box. Are we supposed to live in small boxes? No. no. We're not supposed to live in any dang box at all. We're supposed to I, what, what I call, call living big and dreaming tall. Exploding that box so we can fully live into the possibility and expression of life what we were created to do. We were not brought here just to pay bills and die. Yeah. Right? Can I have an amen on a Friday? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is true. It is true. It is true. So that's why it was such an honor for me to come talk about fantasy. Because if you were, when I was growing up as a little boy in Fremont, Nebraska, if you would have looked at me of what was possible, everything I've done would have been fantasy. It would not have been possible for some guy who's dad is a truck driver and whose mom had never learned how to drive a car to have this kind of future unfold. But we have to give ourselves that permission and to honor that fantasy that lives within each and every one of us. Because if we sell out on that, then our lights go dim. And more now than ever, we have to burn bright. Right? We have to burn bright in order so other people can have permission to get beyond those things that are closing them down as far as fear goes. So let me tell you a couple of little things about who I am. My name is Dean Jacobs. I was born in the small town of Wahoo, Nebraska. Can you all say Wahoo for me? Wahoo! Wahoo. <laughs> you can be born anywhere. Wahoo's good as any place to be. It's just fun to say. And when I was five, we moved from the farm to the city of Fremont, where my dad became a trucker, and my mom was a housewife. 
And I went through that public school system, that awesome school in Wayne State College in Wayne, Nebraska, where I got a degree in biology and graduated from high school, I mean college, and eventually went into Pfizer. Now the reason why I'm telling you all this really boring stuff is, I want you to be clear about one thing, and that is, I'm just an ordinary, ordinary guy from Nebraska who happened to have a dream that he was not willing to let go of. Now eventually, and I, traveling and that working through Pfizer for 10 years, I started asking myself those important questions. Questions like, how much stuff does one really need in order to be happy? You know that question? How much stuff do we really need in order to be happy? When I got serious about answering that question, then the next thing that came to my heart was, well, Dean, what do you dream about? So how, how many of you guys dream? How many of you daydream at creative meetings? <laughs> yeah, well that's one form of dreaming, right? That's one form of dreaming. Well, I had a dream, and that was a dream to take a trip all the way around the world. And not just a two-week holiday, but more of a journey, allow the essence of a place to sink into your skin so you can begin to understand what it means to live in some place like Australia, New Zealand, Nepal, or certain parts of Africa and Asia. Now, you've heard of the seven wonders of the world, right? You know, the pyramids of Egypt, the hangars of Babylon, the lighthouse of Alexander named three. Well, I went seeking seven other wonders. The wonders of sight, the wonders of hearing, the wonders of smell, the wonders of taste, the wonders of touch, the wonders of laughter, and the wonders of love. Because those are the wonders of humanity. They're priceless, they're timeless. You cannot buy those things. They can only be experienced for those who are willing to trust their hearts, be engaged, and follow their dreams and be engaged in the world. And I wanted to follow my dream so bad, I quit my job and I sold my house to follow my dream. Now, I never said I was sane, right? <laughs> but I'm very committed to fulfilling what I was not brought here just to pay bills and die, but to follow my dream. So I quit my job and I sold my house. Now, there's one thing that's crucial in the alchemy of a fantasy. Otherwise, a fantasy is just these, these thoughts that float around forever. And that one thing that is crucial, well, let me give you an example of how that, that moment happened to me. I could take you to the very spot in Idaho where the day that I called up Pfizer after 10 years of being one of the most successful sales reps in their company, the day I called them up and I said I was leaving. I was leaving. I mean, I've done a lot of crazy things in my life, and people think I'm really brave because I've interviewed rebel generals in the Congo and whitewater raft the Nile and blah, 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 blah. But the bravest thing I've ever done my whole life was the day I called Pfizer up and said I was leaving. Because everything I knew my life to be at that moment in time just went spinning off without me. Right? And all of a sudden, I was left with this blank canvas for me to become the artist of my life instead of the cultural expectations that I had taken on that had really nothing to do with me. And that was probably one of the most freeing moments I've ever had in my entire journey. But what was that happen? What did I do? I took a moment of action. I took some action. Because without action, a dream is just a distraction, right? A dream is just a, a distraction without some form of action. But the moment we put a stake in the ground and make a declaration that the, this is who I'm going to be, this is what I stand for, this is the contribution I'm going to make, this is the difference I'm going to make in the world, then we shift what's possible. And our creative juices then get to really what? Run wild and run free as they were supposed to be when we were born in the very beginning. These are my journeys. If you add this up now, it actually represents now seven and a half years of my life going through 57 countries. I need to update my, my flyer. Through 57 countries. This first trip around the world lasted for two years, living on 10 to $15 a day. Going through 28 countries, the highest point I'd ever get to in any of my trips was 18,167 feet high with both feet on the ground when I was exploring the base camp of Mount Everest in Nepal. Where's our Nepali friends? Yeah. Namaste. The lowest point I'd ever get to in any of my journeys was 410 feet below the level of sea, below sea level, where I was floating on the Dead Sea of Israel with no water wings or nothing like that. And I just floated for the first time in my life because I actually don't know how to swim. I don't know how to swim. It's true. I mean, I grew up in Fremont, Nebraska. Right? I never went and learned how to swim. But I'm, I, as I'm always telling the kids, 
On that other side of that wall of fear, there is a whole world that's waiting to be explored. If we let those layers of fear stop us, that compresses us back into what? A small box. We were not made to live in small boxes. We were, we were brought here to live big and dream tall. So in 2004, I went through Central and South America, I got down the Galapagos Islands, went swimming with dolphins. Who would like to go swim with dolphins one day? I'm just curious. Survey say, says we're all going. Good, I like that answer. I got sick on that journey, I had to come home. In 2007, I did another trip around the world. By the way, that little dot in the middle of the United States, you know where that is? That's Nebraska. Did you know that all world tours begin in Nebraska? <laughs> they do for us. Oh, we do now, all right? They do for us, because this is where we live. So I always keep coming home back to Nebraska. And I did this blue line around the world, and I went to explore the Nile rivers of Africa, went to the beginning of the Blue Nile, in Ethiopia, the beginning of the White Nile in Uganda, followed through the Mediterranean, up to the Mediterranean, and up there. And then I did this thing called the Trans-Siberian Railroad. I took, I took that long train ride across Russia, Mongolia, and China. And when I was in China for a full day, I went for a long walk on the Great Wall of what? China. And for a full day, I hung out with a little black and white furry guys called pandas. Who wants to hang out with a panda for a day? That's good for our creative juices, isn't it? They're so cute. They're so cute. Anyway, came back home, Re regrouped from that. While I was on that journey, I met some people in Rwanda, Africa. And in 2009, I was living on the sides of volcanoes in Rwanda, Africa, working for the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International. Do you remember the movie Gorillas in the Mist? Right? While, while I was passing through there in 2007, I met the vice president, totally by serendipity. And they said, we like your attitude, and we like your skill set. Would you come work for us? So for seven and a half months, I got paid to hang out with mountain gorillas, which is pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. Came back home from that, regrouped, and then 2011, I went to go finish what I started in 2004, and I spent six months looking at the Amazon River and Rain Basin of South America. I went to where the Amazon River begins in southern Peru at 17,000 feet, followed it for 1,000 miles through the canyons, and then I floated 3,000 miles down the Amazon on cargo ships, just hanging my hammock up, getting off and on, then going to the forest to explore the, the nature and the indigenous people that call the Amazon home, which is pretty cool. And then 2013, I did this, this beautiful yellow line through the middle of the United States, which represents which river? Anyway, I want to get this? The Mississippi. The Mississippi. Well, you had a 50-50 chance, all right? But, <laughs> <laughs> But the Mississippi, and I canoed it for two months from Lake Itasca all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, if you're going to paddle it, you'd have to paddle it every day for three months. I only had two months, so I did it in sections. But I got from Lake Itasca all the way down to the Gulf. So all of this traveling has given me a special perspective, one that I'm going to share with you all today for just a small window of time to remind us just how precious and how beautiful life really is. And one of the most important things I want to make sure that you are clear about is that dreams aren't for special people, they are for everyone. They're for everyone, right? And why do I know that? Because I put a stake in the ground and said, you know what, I'm going to live my life from my heart and follow my dream. That doesn't mean it always turns out beautiful or easy or nice. It means it becomes an authentic expression of my life and the contribution I'm here to make. That makes sense? So, it's action. Dream without action is just a distraction. So we take that fantasy, we combine it with some action, and magic starts to happen. Now, the title of my talk, for this brief time I get to be with you guys, because I could tell you stories for days, is fantasy to reality. And there was a couple very special moments on my journey that I wanted to highlight that help me make the point that I want to share with you today. And it happened, one of them happened in Nepal. Now this happened on my first trip and it was, uh, it was going for two years. When I got to Nepal, they told me it would cost anywhere between twenty-five and fifty thousand dollars to climb to the top of Mount Everest. Now what was my daily budget? <laughs> Ten to fifteen bucks a day, exactly. So that doesn't work. But to go to the base camp and to go hiking just costs you little camping fees along the way. So for two months, I hiked to the Himalayas of Nepal. That's not me, thank goodness. Right? But how would you like to carry that book bag? And then 
I would camp in villages along the way. And this day I was camping, I love this photo because it brings back this memory for me. This day I was camping in this village on my way to the Mount Everest base camp. And I was playing a game with them. You know what game I was playing? Hide and go seek. Anybody in here play hide and go seek? Cool. And pretty soon, when I was playing hide and go seek with these kids, pretty soon their parents started to play hide and go seek. And then pretty soon, the whole village was playing hide and go seek. <laughs> now, wouldn't it be just the greatest fantasy ever if the whole city of Omaha, Nebraska, one day played hide and go seek? <laughs> wouldn't it be cool? We would make world news. I keep throwing that out there. There's a challenge for you, we never coast people, all right? <laughs> that one day the whole city of Omaha, Nebraska plays I can go seek. That would be so cool. I kind of half jokingly say it and I actually, actually seriously say it too. Because why not? Because even though we're adults, we're still kids, right? I hope we haven't forgot the joy of playing hide and go seek. Because if we have, then we got some work to do. That's all. All right? Now the real reason I was heading to Nepal was to go see this place. This is the base camp of Mount Everest. I used to mountain climb a lot. I lived in Seattle, Washington. So if you all wonder if you ever left Nebraska besides traveling, yes, I lived in Seattle, Washington for seven years. And I used to mountain climb quite a bit in the Cascade Mountains. And that's part of why I wanted to go see Mount Everest. And I was moving around the base camp. This is an expedition from South Korea. And then I met this guy. His name was John Anderson. And he was getting ready, he was from Australia. He was getting ready to do a climb. To the, he was getting ready to make a summit up Everest. And he invited me on a hike, a conditioning hike he was doing. They were gonna climb a mountain called Kalabatar which sits close to the base camp, and it gives you a chance to actually see Mount Everest because you actually can't see the top of Mount Everest from the base camp. So he said, come on with me. So I went with him. So we're climbing up the top of Calabatar, and it's taking about three hours, and I look down the end of the valley, and there's this big bank of clouds coming up this valley until by the time I got to the top of Calabatar, Mount Everest was lost in the fog. And I was so bummed because I just wanted to see Mount Everest. <laughs> I didn't want to climb it. I don't have $50,000. I didn't have the want to, more importantly, to climb it. I just wanted to see it. And John turns to me in his great Australian accent. He goes, you know what, here, mate? I've been up here before. <laughs> Usually when the, saw, the fog comes in, it socks in for the night, I'm going to leave ya. I said, all right, John, I'm going to stay. Because my gut, my heart tells me, stick around a little longer. How many of you creatives really trust your heart and your guts? Yeah. And how many times has that opened up to magic? Yeah. So now I'm at 18,167 feet high at this moment. All the clothing that's on my journey is now on my body. I didn't have my pink bath towel wrapped around the top of my head. I did. Because I know that when the sun goes down at 18,000 feet, it's going to get really what, guys? It's going to get cold. It's going to get cold. So I'm hunkered down behind this rock. The wind is just whipping and blowing. Shh. 20 minutes after John leaves. Instantly, all the clouds disappeared. Uh-huh. And there I was, with the sun going down over my shoulder, and right in front of me is Mount Everest. And at this point, the tears are running down my cheeks like a river. Because what happened was, it all came back, that fantasy, that dream that I had let go of 25 years ago all came into existence in that moment of time. And when it goes from a dream to reality, it's priceless and timeless. So part of the balance in my step and the smile on this guy's face is the fulfillment of a dream that looked like this for me. Yeah. We all got to have a dream, whether we're five or we're 95. Because what that is, that's a belief in today and a faith in tomorrow. And if we let other people determine what that dream is, we have subjected to someone else's agenda that may not be the best thing for us. It's just definitely not a good way to live a life. So that was one. And by the way, once you have this moment, you know very clear for the rest of your lives, dreams come true. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is not a fantasy. This is reality. And that treasure lives within us for the rest of our life. I could be flipping hamburgers. Or what, nothing against hamburger flippers, but you know what I mean. You know, I could be flipping hamburgers, and no one's ever going to take that away from me. Ever. Ever. So I challenge you, Omaha creatives, make sure you search your hearts for those dreams. 
Search them, dig them, re-bring them back up, especially the ones that you had when you're younger, because they will add that juice. And if you do rediscover those and fulfill them, what difference was that going to make in the quality of your life now? Right? It's gonna, it becomes a needle mover. It, ha, it matters to us. It may not matter to anybody else as far as Mount Everest did, but it mattered to me. And that's part of what juices me up to get out of bed, even those days when I don't want to do it. Another moment that happened that I just wanted to share briefly with you uh, was this. So I believe that when we start trusting our fantasies and moving into the world, following our dreams, we start to get opportunities that are presented to us that we couldn't even begin to imagine. And when I was at Wayne State College, not even my wildest fantasies could I ever imagine that Dean Jacobs would be living with mountain gorillas in Rwanda, Africa for seven and a half months. Not in my wildest fantasies. But because I kept trusting my heart and putting my whole self out there, I love the hokey pokey. You guys know that song? <laughs> I love the hokey pokey. The last verse of the hokey pokey is what? You put your whole self in, you put your whole self out. You put your whole self in and you what? You shake it all about. And when you put your whole self in and you shake it all about, magical things start to happen. So the next time, yeah, 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 here for the hokey pokey. <laughs> so the next time that you're like down, just remember Dean Jacobs said, do the hokey pokey, all right? And shit, but it's so true, right? It's so true. Now, um, so I had this opportunity to hang out with the mountain gorillas. The smallest group of gorillas I got to hang out with had three gorillas in it. This is what I look like until I get my coffee, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then the largest group of gorillas actually had 45 gorillas in it. 45. Now, what's missing here? There's no bars. There's no windows. Right? There's no bars. There's the windows that separate me from the gorillas. So they actually taught me how to talk to the gorillas. So that way I could be in communication. You guys want to learn how to talk to gorillas on a Friday morning? Yeah. All right. It's a good idea. So when I would enter this group, you, I would make it sound like this, and you can repeat this after me. I would make it sound like this. <clears throat> so try that. <laughs> now, you're communicating with a guy who weighs 450 pounds, silverback, who's solid muscle. So if I was communicating with him, I would probably give it a little more mm -mm into it. So, <laughs> so re repeat after me one more time. <clears throat> Oh, there we go. There we're better. <laughs> Besides, any guy who weighs 450 pounds, you would like his permission, yes? yes? To hang out with him for a day because the truth is he could break you in half with one hand if you really wanted to. He could. They're so strong. Man, matter of fact, one time I made one mad. He was pulling trees up and then, uh, puffing up his lips and the tracker I was with. The guy's going, Dean, Dean, get down because you're supposed to break eye contact and get down on the ground. I said, dude, I'm rolling on the ground. <laughs> I can't get any lower than that. Right? But I thought you might like to see, for just a moment, some of the magic of nature. Because I think nature also feeds our fantasy. So if you're struggling a little bit with the juices, go for a walk outside. You have this beautiful river called the Missouri right in your back door. There's Fontenelle Forest, and I, I'm not that familiar with Omaha, all of them, but there's a lot of stuff here. But let me show you what it's like to hang out with mountain gorillas. This is my, watch what happens up here. <laughs> this guy's gonna show us how tough he is. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And then people ask me all the time, how close did I get? I was so close to this guy, I could reach out and touch him. I could reach out and touch him. Now he's mad, how I know that? Because he's puffing up his lips showing it that he's not happy with somebody behind me. Then his friends decide to climb the bamboo forest. This turns out not to be such a great idea. <laughs> and then I borrow a little Nebraska here. It's a good life. It's a good life to hang out with the gorillas. Now, as a photographer, we don't have time to change lenses when nature is doing its thing. So I always had two lenses. I had a zoom lens 
and then I had another lens over my left hand shoulder which was a wide angle lens. We're supposed to stay 15 feet away from the gorillas, but do you think the gorillas always know the rules? Or do they obey them? No. Anyway, so I'm taking photos, and, and by, be, the reason why we do that, because number one, I could exchange diseases with the gorillas, and I, there's only 800 left in the whole world, and I don't want to be the guy who's responsible for uh, you know, wiping them off the face of the earth. And the, um, the other thing is, the, you, they will remember you, they told me. This gorillas, they will remember you when you come back one day, especially the little ones, because the little ones will come up and hit me sometimes <laughs> to see if I've become their best friend kind of thing. And they said, they'll remember you. And if they, if they, when you come back one day, they'll be really happy to see you, and they'll come get you, and they'll pull you through the forest like a rag doll, <laughs> which wouldn't be so good for me, right? So I was always trying to keep my distance, and I was ignoring them. And I'm like, taking photos, I have the zoom lens, and right below my feet is a baby gorilla. Right below this camera. And I'm ignoring him like I'm supposed to do. And I'm doing this, and he's doing this. What was he doing? Looking at his reflection in, the, in that camera, which is amazing, because even gorillas are curious about life. We have to have curiosity. It is the food for our fantasy. If we don't have curiosity, fantasy doesn't go anywhere. That hunger to learn, to grow, to understand. And that is what what do you think has pulled me through 57 countries around the world now in seven and a half years of my life? I, sometimes I do programs on university campuses. I always have to tell them that Dean is my name, is not my title. I, you want me to put this back up here? We good. <laughs> okay, good. Dean's my name, not a title. And I don't have a PhD except for mandated by my own heart in curiosity. And no one can ever take it away from me because I gave it to myself. That nur that, that's what nurtures our fantasies and our dreams and things. Because without curiosity, we're done, right? We're done. And so what does this all lead to? This all leads to rainbows in Nebraska. I love that I can travel the whole world, and I can go in my own backyard in Fremont, Nebraska, and find a rainbow. And for me, rainbows represent this, called hope. Hope, that optimism that we're looking forward to tomorrow, and that we know that we have some ownership and a stake in how that's going to be, how that's going to show up, and what we're going to do as far as making a world, leaving it better than what we found it. And with hope, we can change the world. We can. I know this election didn't probably turn out the way that some of us wanted, but we don't give up, because the stakes are too high, right? The stakes are too high. And I, all right, game on. I was talking to some kids the other day. He's like, well, Mr. Dean, what about this? I, I still got the work to do. We all got the work to do. It doesn't change the work that we're going to do and the difference that we have. We all have one small window of time to make the biggest contribution that we can. And it's our responsibility to run with that ball the best that we can. So the list is what I believe. Fantasy feeds the bright light within. Fantasy feeds that bright light within each of us. And right now, as creatives, I think it is our responsibility and our charge that we need to burn brighter than ever. Because that's how we are going to make the contribution that we're capable of making in our Omaha area community and also in the world. And one person can make a difference. Because look at this guy from Fremont, Nebraska, whose dad was a trucker, who also now has traveled the whole world and brings these jewels back inspires kids to dream and inspires Omaha creatives to dream, right? Inspires us to dream. So it is my hope and my wish and my dream that our creative mornings from here on out inspire us to stay true to our hearts and that each and every one of your dreams, whatever they are, come true for each and every one of you. Thank you very much. Yeah.